Welcome to Calumet Roundtable. I'm your co-host, Tom Roach, and I'm joined today uh, by Ken Bernowski. Uh, we're going to talk about the Chicago music scene and a little bit about how that uh, interfaces with the national uh, music industry and, and what that means. Um, my uh, background for this, I guess, is that I teach a class called Rock, Pop, and Rhetoric, and I've uh, hosted some open mic nights, and so I tend to recruit people from the community and bring them into the class to talk about their, uh, their songwriting and their aspirations and to get them to uh, uh, answer questions and interface with students who are interested in, in uh, this topic. Um, Ken uh, has a much deeper background, so he's going to give you a little more information about uh, his background than I did on mine. Ken, uh, tell us about your your history. Well, I'm Ken Bernowski, and I, uh, I, yeah, I have a long history in music in the business. Um, pretty much started playing professionally when I was about 16, 15 or 16, played my first paid jobs. And, and this was Indiana, Chicago? It, in, this, was, uh, this was Indiana, yeah. I actually started, Indiana. started playing uh, when I was about three. Uh, and when I was about three or four years old, I started picking around. I oh, got no serious kidding. about it when I was about, um, uh, when I was like in first grade or second grade, I started getting a little bit more serious. Um, and uh, started taking lessons and all that. And uh, you know, I went through the, the, tip, the typical uh, progression of being a teenager, playing in garage bands, and, and uh, I had aspirations to go out to, uh, in the late 70s, out to Los Angeles to uh, Guitar Institute of Technology, and ended up getting sidetracked into a band that got a record deal, and we did uh, some a touring. Uh, we were together. Yeah. The name of the band was Skatefish, and we were together for about six or seven years. Um, did two albums. We we're, were in a movie, Erg, a music war, and, uh, and a couple of singles. And we were on IRS Records, uh, Miles Copeland's record label, for you know four or five years. So, you know, and then after that, uh, that band broke up. We uh, still kept at it out in Los Angeles, lived out in Los Angeles for a number of years, and still kept pushing it, and I got into recording engineering out there, and uh, I was working consi uh, quite a bit of time in the recording industry, and um, just uh, moved back here to, uh, to uh, uh, Northwest Indiana, actually, to get back into school and get into video. And um, got a degree in video, went out, worked yeah. in video, for a long time right. as a corporate producer for a yeah. number of years. And then I ended up back here for an advanced degree and uh, teaching now. Yeah, and we're happy to have you here. Well, I'm um, happy to be here. Thanks. So uh, it, it sounds like uh, you got your 10,000 hours in uh, pretty early. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I won't feel bad uh, next time you, uh, you blow me away when you're playing guitar because I didn't start when I was three. <laughs> Um, I was just trying to have fun. Yeah, no, you, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you but the, you know, the, the 10,000 hour rule, right? That everybody's it's great at everything. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I started know. playing, like, messing around with piano when I well, was three or four. It was music. Guitar, but. Um, and then uh, you also, uh, I remember uh, you toured the, uh, the world with the police when they were uh, yeah, first we getting did a, recognized in the U.S. And did a lot of tour, did some touring in the United States with Iggy Pop, who was um, kind of the godfather of punk, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then we also recorded, uh, or not recorded, but we toured a lot with uh, the police, did a major tour in Europe with them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so um, I, I wanted to uh, start with the, the police uh, experience for a second, because you were, you were with Sting uh, when he was finding out that they were becoming world famous and that his, he was going to have this serious career here. Uh, which is the situation that a lot of local musicians want to find themselves in. Right, right. But you said that Sting had a very different reaction to that maybe than most people. Um, Can you tell us about that? Well, they had already, by the time we had met them and started working with them, they had already, yeah. they were like the Beatles in Europe. Yeah. Uh, they could play a show and draw 20, 25,000 yeah. uh, in France or Belgium, you right. know. Um, which so is they, everybody in Belgium who's available. Right, right exactly. Available. <laughs> everybody would show up. Yeah. Um, it was rare to find somebody who didn't like the police in Europe. Everybody loved them already. Yeah. And in the United States, they were uh, virtually unknown. Right. So um, they had already made considerable amounts of money. They had been touring for a long time. Um, actually, I do recall Sting pushing yeah. it. Yeah. If yeah. they didn't get, um, if they didn't break in the United States, yeah. With, with, after Roxanne, 
Which, you know, Roxanne, why that ever sold even one copy, I'll never understand, but that's okay, go ahead. Well, they, you know, Roxanne was, you know, I mean, I'd heard it on late night TV and they were yeah. doing these late night shows like Rock World and, yeah. and they were, it was just a whirlwind thing for them. They'd right. just do something and then, and then the producers would put it on here and there and everywhere. Yeah. And uh, uh, so they didn't know that they were becoming popular starting to get a groundswell in the United States. Yeah. And they were, and Sting actually, I think he wanted to give up. He wanted to quit the band, do a, more of a solo career, right. uh, go into the thing he went into. Which he did anyway. Ended right. up being, yeah, three or four, four, four or five years later. Yeah. Uh, and at that point he was ready. I mean, they had already made millions and had a ton of success in right. and, and they were tired of beating the bushes in the United States. Uh, and um, that's, yeah, that's pretty but, much the, what they the were. The record that, uh, that made it first here wasn't Roxanne, right? It was uh, Don't Stand So Close to Me. Right, right? yeah. It was actually yeah. when we were on that tour that, that... Which I think is a much better song, but yeah. Yeah, it was when we were on that tour that right. they really started hitting. And uh, yeah. that's the album. I think it's the second album. Is it right. the second? I'm not sure the chronology of that. So I, that's, that's when they really started hitting, yeah. Okay, so now you've played um, all over um, Northwest Indiana, the Chicago area. Um, with a lot of up-and-coming musicians, um, what's that? You know, what's that path like right now? Well, it's tougher than it's ever been, because uh, mainly because of downloading and streaming and things. You know, it's you can't. I mean, there 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 was an opportunity to actually sell music um, by by record rewriting an album, recording an album. You could sell it locally, uh, vinyl. You know. Yeah. Uh, you could probably, you know, successful local bands were selling 700, 1,000 copies, you know, something like that. So you could kind of get a groundswell going. I mean, uh, back in the days of the record album, they were... Yeah, I mean, there, really? were, there were local bands that were, you know, they'd sell, oh, okay. them, they'd sell albums at shows and whatnot. So you had that outlet. Um, and then, of course, when iTunes first came in, in the, in, you know, 2001, two, right around that era when the iPod, you know, yeah. era came about and the digital industry first yeah. started selling over the internet. Yeah. Everybody was buying songs for 99 cents, so you could put songs up on iTunes and play a lot of shows and promote yourself, and you could actually sell songs for 99 cents. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a client who was making a pretty good living um, writing, writing music, covering yeah. music, and, and selling songs for 99 cents. Now, you run a recording studio. Yeah, uh, right, and, yeah. And so yeah, you I have people come in and you produce Right, uh, not so much anymore since I'm working like here a lot, but yeah. You know, previous to this, yeah, I was I was yeah. doing it pretty much a lot, a lot at home, and um, there was an opportunity there also. Uh, soon after that, um, the pirate, pirate pirating industry just took off. You know, and yeah. and the downloads and file sharing just took off. And what they say is, anything that can be digitized will eventually be free. So you know, right. and that's what happened basically. Um, you know, people have a thousand songs on their iPods and they share them freely. So which this hurt wiped the, out the, yeah. in the industry for for medium level, small and medium level musicians right. to, sell, to sell music. Hmm. So it really had a, a more adverse effect on the up and coming people than it did on the people who were established. I think it had effect across the board. Um, I'm not as tuned into like the upper level, the Beyonce's yeah. and those people, what kind of effect it had on them uh, yeah. from a first hand. Well, they made less money. They make less money, but they still yeah. make, uh, you know, were, I mean, what, how much does a stream cost? A stream costs a fraction of a penny. Yeah. If you if if you're at my level and you and, and you get 150 streams, you make 10 cents. Uh, if you're at Beyonce's level and you get millions and millions of streams, it's a significant amount of money. Right. So there's a difference there. Um, right. I mean, there are different differing opinions. Steve Albini, um, the uh, the engineer uh, for uh, In Utero for um, uh, Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Um, he runs a studio in Chicago now, and he sincerely believes that file sharing and free music is a boost for up-and-coming bands. Well, I mean, it, it can make it easier for you to get noticed, right? And yeah, and and like I like I say, the smart money now is going to people who use their original music, their recordings of original music, to to promote and to market things that can't be digitized, T-shirts. You know, putting butts in the seats in concerts, filling right, concert right. halls. You know, right. the people who can do, use their music now to promote things that can't be digitized can use that to popularize themselves. And, and so, for a, a, a pretty good local band, um, do they need to have someone running promotions for them? Is that is oh, that absolutely. A, I know. mean, you know, well, you know, is from teaching communications and 
and, and marketing and public relations and things yeah. like that, that artists are not always the best marketers. Right. Uh, you need both sides of the coin, you know, right. to get things going. So, yeah, it's true. It definitely would be true that people who have yeah. professional marketing people working for them do better. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Um, a, a bit of a digression here, but, uh, but not unrelated. Um, the people who make it, um, are they significantly better than anyone you would find playing locally, or is, 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 is there an element of being in the right place at the right time, having the right support apparatus? I don't really think there's a pat answer to that. I mean, you know, some people, you know what I would say is you can't, you can't hold a great songwriter down. A great songwriter is going to rise above yeah. the, the, the average, you know. Um, so the Beatles would have made it without Brian Epstein. I think they, maybe not I think Elvis they Elvis would have made it somewhere. You'd have heard of them. I mean, they were just yeah. writing too many great songs. Uh, you have yeah. to con you have to consider the fact that maybe their great writing was also spurred on partially by the fact that they had a great manager and he was making them right. popular. And now, right. boy, we have to produce. You know, one of the things that he did is he he when their first record was released, he bought them all to make it look like they were popular so that they'd show up on the chart. Well, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, he really, you know, he really was fudging the, the system to, to make them Well, uh, and that notice. goes back yeah. to Frank Sinatra. I mean, uh, Frank Sinatra's manager used to pay the Bobby Soxers to stand in the front row and faint. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they'd pay, you know, they'd, and yeah. it would create a scene where yeah. people would want to be part of that. Yeah. So that goes way back, you know. Yeah. It probably goes back to Vaudeville. Well, well and... let me put it this way uh, before we, uh, we go to the break here. Um, how many times have you seen somebody playing locally at an open mic or, you know, at a bar or something, and you thought, this person as good as anybody it's, I've ever seen on a stage, or, or maybe not at all. Have you ever, ever had that experience? It, well, it depends on what you mean by, by as good as. I mean, is, is in a real generic way. Uh, as a performer, as a writer, all 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 of that. Put Take together. your pick. Yeah. Um, not too often. Not too often. A ever? And, ever? Uh, yeah. You see people who are who are pretty pretty phenomenal, but you think, well, it's a shame that they don't have the forum, they don't have the opportunity yeah. to get their music out and get their talent out. Um, but if somebody is really, really great at entertaining people, and um, they're, yeah. they're going to get noticed. They're going to get noticed. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a rare, I think it's a rare, it's a more rare commodity than a lot of people think. Yeah. So, um, um, so if somebody really has the talent then, uh, even if the things aren't breaking for them at a given time, you think that they'll, eventually they'll rise to the top. Not rise to the top, but, they, but if, they, if they're persistent and they keep at it, they're going to get some kind of attention. Yeah. They're going to, and, and I mean, there's so many people doing it now. Yeah. I mean, are there starving artists on street corners? Sure. Yeah. You know, starving artists who are really good yeah. and could be great artists yeah. that a lot of people would appreciate. So we, and we've had, times. yeah, sure. Yeah, we, and we've had a lot of people, uh, you know, great acts come out of Chicago, Chicago being one of them, for instance, right? Uh, did you ever see some, you know, one of these acts that made it early on and, and get a sense that they were really going to go somewhere? Well, we used to work with, you know, we'd, we used to see Cheap Trick, and I think I, if, I memory was, if memory serves, we did a couple jobs with them, you know, yeah. when they were up and coming, and they were already kind of making it. Um, but it was pretty obvious well, that they had something. So you knew it. Yeah, they, yeah. they had something that yeah. was exciting crowds beyond what your average yeah. club band was yeah. doing. You know, they yeah. had great songs. Yeah. They, had, they had the gimmick. They had the two kind of uh, uh, hipster doofus guys and the two good-looking guys. So they had a look <laughs> was that, it? that people could hook into. <laughs> There's um, the formula, everybody. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break. The Kelly Mitt Roundtable will be right back. Thank you. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach, and my co-host today is Ken Bernowski, and we were talking about the uh, Chicago music scene and also about the relationship between the local artist and the, um, the people that have made it nationally and internationally and uh, what, how much that's dependent on news coverage, reviews, uh, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, just for a second, I want to acknowledge the Chicago sound. 
Uh, we, you know, I know in the, uh, in the pre-rock days, this was a uh, center for blues music. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the, the understanding of that is that it follows the Mississippi up, right? New Orleans sure. and yeah. St. Louis and uh, Chicago and then Kansas City, I guess, is the, uh, the, was the fourth city. Mm -hmm. um, and we still have, uh, you know, Buddy Guy playing uh, weekly, I think, uh, unless he's traveling in Chicago. Uh, and um, in Joliet, we have um, T. Bird Hawk, who was indicted into the, inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame um, just uh, a year ago, I think, uh, along with Buddy Guy. And um, uh, some other people from there, Siegel Schwal, I think. Um, I think they inducted Muddy Waters in finally uh, and some things like that. Um, so this has been a, a key area for that and also for the development of uh, rock and roll music because of that connection. Uh, I know the Stones came here to do a, a couple recordings in the, the studio checker, that yeah, the checker blues checker artists checker. used. Yeah. Um, what, what a, let's, let's just explore that for a minute. What, what, what is that studio that, uh, on the south side? That, uh, Chess. Chess Studio, yeah. Um, have you ever, did you ever uh, visit there while you know, it was still actually, going? You know, actually, yeah, when I was really young, we, 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 uh, when we were still, you know, just kind of writing songs, and we yeah. were trying to, we, we didn't know what was going on. We were teenagers, 17 or something. And yeah. we want, we want, excuse me, we wanted to just check out some studios, and we did stumble into that studio and talk to some people, and I don't even know if it was still called Chess or not at that yeah. point. I, yeah. I'm not really familiar with the, with the history of the studio. Well, about when was this, 70s sometime? It had to be in the 70s, yeah. yeah. Um, and we were just going to studios. We went to Universal, just walked in, you know, and yeah. hey, we're here, you know. That's so, <laughs> so the Chess one, I mean, how informal was it? <clears throat> it was very informal. I mean, there was yeah. just somebody at a desk, and it was, um, it was on South Michigan Avenue. Yeah. Um, oh, it was. So they moved at that. Point. And I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. It was, whatever they called it, but it was the chess people. You know, yeah. whoever inherited that. Right. Right. Lineage. Yeah. Um, uh, T Bird uh, from Joliet uh, tells a story about how uh, he and uh, Mike Sensanelli, the bass player, um, went to. Um, oh gosh. Uh, Howlin' Wolf's house, I think, right? Did Howlin' Wolf live on the south side? <coughs> I believe so, yeah. yeah. I'm sure he did, yeah. And, uh, and his wife, they, knock, they got up their nerve and knocked on the door, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and uh, they said they were there to see the wolf or something, and his, <laughs> so his wife goes, says, well, I'll wake him up, and they're like, no, don't wake up the wolf, don't wake up the yeah. wolf, and she yeah. said, no, I'll go get him. And he, so he came out, and he sat down at the kitchen table with them, and uh, uh, you know, they drank some tea or something and had yeah. a very... Uh, casual, uh, form, kind of somewhat formal conversation, and they became friends, and he used them to, uh, you know, as a backup a couple times, uh, uh, or, or a second band when he played out. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it was interesting. So here's this sort of national uh, reputation that Chicago has, and this person who's got almost, you know, certainly a historic uh, uh, profile, yeah. nationally and internationally, but, you know, he was a local guy, yeah. and if you knocked on his door, he invited you in for you know, for coffee. So they, they said they, they didn't think he was uh, drinking any alcohol at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, um, yeah, that's, um, yeah. I think if you go back far enough, I mean, you go back into the 60s, <clears throat> and if it wasn't for the British invasion, you know, the Rolling Stones picking up the blues and yeah. Eric Clapton and all the British people, and, you know, and the Chicago people too, there was, there was some uh, white, you know, Chicago people that started to play the blues. Yeah. Um, and it, it, the, the effect was kind of the same thing that Elvis had in the 50s, yeah. Taken black music, and uh, that was that was only acceptable in certain circles, and and a white person comes yeah. along and cops the whole thing, yeah. and then all of a sudden it's a, it's the huge, and then from yeah. there everybody backs up and grandfathers in all the original black performers, and which is the same thing that happened here. Yeah. Nobody knew who Muddy Waters was. Nobody. Knew. Willie Dixon's a genius. I mean, he's yeah. he, he revamped the entire concept of the blues. Right. Um, uh, and well, but nobody you know, knew who he, he was. You know, even uh, Chuck Berry, uh, you know, really kind of transitioned all that into rock and roll. I mean, right. In many ways, he, he's an inventor of rock and roll. He wrote songs about rock and roll, like yeah. over Beethoven and things. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Um, I just, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm just amazed, though, that, you know, you, could, you think that, that rock and popular music is, uh, you know, it's just sort of all-encompassing. But if you look locally uh, in Joliet, for instance, there's, th there's at least, well, in the Joliet area, there's at least three places you can go three different nights a week for a blues jam. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we've got three places where you can go and do a rock jam. 
the um, area, you know, but there's, yeah, I mean, there's at least as much support for that as there is for anything else, even though that's not what's selling in those proportions, right? Right. Well, I think the reason the blue, you can do the blues jam yeah. and why they're so popular, well, for one thing, this is Chicago, and yeah. so this is the kind of the cradle of the electric blues, you know, yeah. but um, the, the thing is, everything's based on, everything's based on uh, the one, four, five, twelve bar, so everybody knows it. You don't have to learn no, the song. Okay, so tell us, what, what's the one four? The one four five is, uh, hopefully no, I won't bang my mic here. Um, it's like, there's the one. Okay. There's the four. Yeah. Back to the one. And you just cycle. Back to the four, yeah. and then the five. And there's, of course, based on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then the names of the, the, the uh, notes in the major scale. One, yeah. two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, five. So what's the song we know that has that in it? Oh, uh, gosh, there are thousands. I mean, I, mean, one I can I... make one up right no, now. No, 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 but I'm giving you one that we might be familiar <laughs> um, with. Let's see. We could do something like, uh, there's a red house over yonder. Just do some Jimmy, you know. That's where my baby stays. And, of course, it's, it's got this A, A, B thing, too. Yeah. So you go back to the four, and you go, there's a red house over yonder. That's where my baby stays. So you're... That's you repeat yeah. the A A and then and then you go to the B. I seen my baby in ninety nine and one half days, you know, and then turn around and yeah. everybody knows that, you know, yeah. and then Well and so that's I mean, isn't that why this is so popular? Because anyone can get up on stage and pretty much play along with yes. the music because they're all using the pretty much one or two of the same structures, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And of course there's people who do it better and people who do it not as right. good. And um, I, I tell you, I I've sat there watching uh, T Bird a couple times thinking this is as good as any live performance I've ever seen. And I, yeah, he puts know, on a good show, yeah. He oh, he's just yeah, he's just amazing. You yeah. Know? He's got a great band too. He's always got a great he band. He attracts the best musicians, yeah. That's the key, you know. Yeah. And the people who come to uh, you know, to to jam, you know, when he's done are usually yeah. outstanding too. I mean that's really a Mm -hmm. Interesting phenomenon. This, but you know, you get into rock jams, you're not going to have as many rock jams because it's what somebody calls out a, a, a sticks or something. You know, how, yeah. how many people know, or even 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 yeah. Pink Floyd or uh, more, moder more modern rock bands, uh, the current rock bands, do they have changes in them. It's not one, four, five. You have to oh, know yeah. the song. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, one of my <laughs> favorite songs is Don't Think Twice, right? But I can't go to a, well, a jam and play that because it has too many changes in it, and by the time people figure it out, I'm done with the song. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah. the current rock, what's going on, of course, is a combination of that folk, which is East European yeah. music, yeah. Uh, Irish music, British music, and it's a combination of African music, you know, the right. blues, which started, right. you know, right. in the South, and it all just kind of converged into and country music. Um, it, it converged into what is rock now. And, and, and actually, if you think about the Rolling Stones, when they first started out, you know, you got... Yeah. I wish I had my guitar here. I mean, that's a country song. You think? Yeah. Yeah, because the bass is... It sounds country when you do that. Yeah, yeah it's country music. And, and, but people don't think of the Stones as and being country music. And that's the last music. time. That's the last time. Yeah. Or if you go... Easy to do the well, things horses. that you wanted. Yeah, you bought them for you. You know, so you got wild horses, country. which is a country theme. Yeah. You know, blues people don't talk about horses. Right. Country right. people talk about horses. Right. And that's Although country. Nobody's music. talking about horses anymore because you know they're kind of rare. Probably yeah. not. Yeah yeah. 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 I don't know. Well, I know what people yeah. are talking about now, but yeah. Um, yeah, it, that, that's definitely a country theme. So you have all these influences <laughs> mixed in to create what became rock, and right. rock really hasn't, you know, that, that kind of rock really hasn't changed since the 60s. It's still being written, it's still being performed. Um, a lot of new things have come up, but that's still there. Yeah, the rock is kind of anything goes. Yeah. I, I had an um, interesting experience when I was teaching this rock, pop, and rhetoric class. Um, the first semester I taught it, I tried to come up to speed with the really contemporary music, um, and what I found is that the, some of the students might be familiar with what I was talking about, but others weren't, because there's just so much variety today. And when I talked about the oldies music, which is what I wanted to talk about anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody knew what I was talking about. Yeah. They all remember. They all knew the songs. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, the next time I taught it, I ended up just focusing on the old standards yeah. and using those as examples. Um, 
but um, but that's one of the big differences today. I think you know is that it, it, you know we've gone is that day when everybody was listening to w, uh, WLS or WCFL, and we all you know you say to somebody '96 Tears, and they know the song, and they can you know sing along with you uh, because you had to hear that if you had the radio on, you heard that song in the 1960s. But uh, today everybody's focused on something else, and there's no common. Well, I think I yeah. think there's a lot more uh, forms of entertainment that people can uh, yeah. tap into these days. I mean, what we had uh, in the '60s and '70s, and even into the '80s, we pretty much had music. Right. I mean, everybody listened to music. That was the music was the glue, as the, you know, a yeah. lot of people say. Yeah. It was the glue that held the, the the generation together. Right. Now, I mean, things there's there's so there's gaming. There's right. there's so many different things that people but, do. But it means that when you're when you're jamming, right. Uh, that it's less likely that you're going to be able to play anything other than blues or classic rock, yeah. because th those are the only two two pools of common uh, music that you've got to work from. Right. Yeah. Right. For, yeah. And 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 there are you know I mean there there's it's that commonality that pulls it together exactly. Yeah. It's the fact that everybody knows the songs. Yeah. And then if you get into the jazz genres, I mean there's well then those jazz players can do do anything. They'll play. But it's don't the same twice thing. With me you know, it's, it's like exactly the same <laughs> They'll thing. They'll hit it on the second measure, right? Blues <laughs> players know the one, yeah. four, five, twelve bar, and then you have somebody like T Bone Walker who came out in the forties and fifties and wrote, uh, what did he write? Uh, 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 Call a Stormy Monday. And what did he do? He went two, three. Right. You know, so he's he's still doing the 12 bar, but he's putting all these jazzier chords in, and he kind of legitimized bringing a little bit more jazz into yeah. blues. Yeah. Um, it's still controversial, but but, is, but okay. you know, but but when you get into a, a, a jazz jam, everybody knows you say a two right. five one. You know. So everybody knows that. You go to a blues jam and you say two five one, and it's like eh, a few people might know what you're talking yeah. about. You know, but not everybody. So you don't have the commonality. You miss that. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I'm more of a listener than a player, so um, I, that this helps me uh, know what I'm uh, looking for. I think. Thank you. Uh, that is all the time we have on the program today, um, and thank you for joining us. Calumet Roundtable. Uh, we'll be back next week. Have a great day. Enough. <laughs>